Okay, hello everyone, welcome back to Deep Learning Systems Action Implementation. Um, in the last lecture, we talked about how we can use different um, acceleration techniques, especially how can we make use of memory reuse to be able to accelerate our linear algebra operations on a CPU. So today we're going to go to a different uh, related topic, which is, you know, imagine that we start to use modern acceleration hardware like a GPU. How can we, uh, you know, leverage some of the properties of a GPU to help us accelerate some of the computations? Of course, the topic of GPU acceleration is quite large, so it's impossible to cover everything within a single lecture. Our hope is that hopefully this lecture is going to give you enough of a background so that we can start exploring this topic and you will be able to make use of the lessons you learned in this class to be able to work on some of your homework three. So let's get started. This lecture is going to focus on two parts. So the first part, we're going to uh, do a high level overview of GPU programming. And the second part, we're going to do a case study on how can we leverage the techniques we learned in the first part to be able to accelerate malicious applications on our GPU. So let's start with the first part. So first, what is a GPU? So uh, if you start to think about a GPU, uh, by the way, in this lecture, we're going to use NVIDIA's CUDA as the primary programming model. Uh, this is because you know you can find a lot more materials around CUDA, but there are also other relevant GPU programming models such as SYCL, One API from Intel, and OpenCL that you can also go and take a look at. So to come back to the topic, what is a GPU? So normally, if you look at parallel computing, you will find that you know the most familiar thing you are looking at would be you know just having multiple kinds of general purpose processors in here, right? So general purpose processors can uh, include things like, for example, here we have like four CPU cores. And one of the key properties of those general purpose processors is that they, are, they have a lot of the flexibility in terms of, you know, in terms of control, how you can go and ask each of these cores to, to do different things. For example, I could run my you know, web browser on one of my CPU cores while running a game on another CPU core without a problem. This is because each of the CPU cores have their own control. Right? You can imagine that in, in order to perform some task, each of the hardware will need kind of have two kind of things. One kind of thing is the, what we call commander unit, which is the control unit that try to give commands on, hey, what are the next steps you want to go and work on? And then there will be soldiers that go and really execute those tasks. And those soldiers are what we call data paths that allows us to be able to you know, fetch data from the memory uh, doing computations on registers and store the data back. A typical CPU will have a very strong commander unit or, 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 or control unit that allows us to do different kinds of tasks. So the brown trains, they can have flexibilities, have to have each of a core doing different things, while you can even have a single core context switching between different tasks very flexibly. Right? So as a result, there are a lot of the emphasis on being able to have flexible control. On the other hand, one thing that people start to realize, at least in the area of graphics, is that when we start to go and render things, we are doing a lot of similar things, right? We are, we are for example, if you want to be able to add brightness to the entire image, likely what you need to do is you want to be able to add the same value to all the pixels. So that's the same task. So you don't need a lot of commanders to, to, to be able to command the soldiers. Instead, you want a huge amount of soldiers that go ahead and perform the task while having a few commanders to come and, 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 and you give command on how exactly you want to do things. And that's kind of motivates a different kind of hardware architecture, and, uh, which is kind of a GPU architecture on the right hand side. Of course, this is only an illustration of what roughly is going on. But you can find that there's a huge amount of green areas here that correspond to the computing soldiers that allows people to come in and do highly intensive arithmetic tasks. Well, let's do control unit. We will have like a fewer control unit that controls a huge group of soldiers. So as a result, it's harder to say like, you know, soldier one, go ahead and go north. Soldier two, go ahead and do, you go south and do a completely different task. 
and that's not what GPU is good at. But instead, if we go ahead and say, you know, hey, all those soldiers should do a similar tasks, and it, those tasks come from a single commander, likely, you know, it is something that a task that, that uh, you know, massive pre parallel computing unit like GPU is good at. So that's kind of like one of the main difference between CPU and GPU. And why do we need GPU programming? So I still remember like, you know, when I started work on deep learning, um, the, the first machine learning, deep learning model that we, we, we built, actually we tried to attempt and run it on a CPU that we had using the most state of our libraries, which leverages like FFT for convolution. It still took us about a week then to be able to even run that model end to end. But then we start to switch over to a GPU and that time got reduced to several hours, which is kind of amazing speed up that you can get. Because, you know, the, of course there's no free, free lunch, right? So the, 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 the trade off here is we are trying to dedicate a lot more resources to the compute and, and trying to ask all the computation units to do the similar things. So as a result, by leveraging a, by leveraging a GPU, you can usually observe more than 10x or sometimes 100x speed up versus the traditional kind of computing. And GPU is still in the powerhouse that powers almost all the deep learning workloads today. Of course, there are even more specialized hardware being coming up, right? Which we don't have to have time to talk about today, but still a very important topic that uh, you know all of us are. But GPU itself is kind of indispensable nowadays in order to run deep learning workloads. So here's like a why GPU gives you this massive parallelism, but then there's a question of how we can come back and program those massively parallel units. And that comes back to the GPU programming model. In this case, we're gonna use CUDA's terminology uh, in this lecture, but you know, usually there's a direct mapping between those concepts in other GPU programming models. For example, you know, the mapping between CUDA to OpenCL, which is a programming model that used by some ARM GPUs and other mobile GPUs. SYCL is another one that uh, is, you know, that is being pushed by a lot of the um, Kurokana's open com community standard. And Apple had a standard called Metal that is working on similar things. So effectively, a GPU's programming model is what we call single instruction multiple threads. The idea is that we're gonna specify the code that one thread is gonna execute. So in here, there's this specific concept of single thread. And effectively, all the threads execute the same code. But then there's a question, you know, if all the threads execute the same code, but what's the difference between the thread? The idea is that each of the thread will have their own context, specifically the, the, their locations, the thread ID, uh, and, and then, you know, they are, there can be slightly different executions in terms of data they load and data they store into. Another interesting thing is that we're gonna group the threads onto what we call blocks. And the thread within the same blocks also share uh, some kind of common resources so that they will be able to, you know, for example, they had a shared memory that allow, you know, thread within the same block to be able to uh, share data with each other. Finally, all the thread blocks are then group, grouped into what we call a launching grid that contains multiple blocks. And then when we, are, when we say, you know, hey, I want to go ahead and launch a GPU kernel, what we really say is we are going to launch all this grid of thread blocks that contains multiple threads within the, within the grid. Okay, so one of the interesting things you can find in here is that this GPU program model contains two levels of hierarchy. We have the thread block as the first level, and the, and, the, and the launching grid as the second level. And this kind of two, two level hierarchy will also come back when we start to talk about more advanced programming models such as shared memory programming. Okay, so to give you a sense of what might look like, let's start to look at a simple CUDA code in here. And in here, this is an example code that performs vector add. So on top, uh, let's assume that we want to do CI equals AI times BI. So in fact, we have a vector add in here. And you can find the code on the top is how we do that in a CPU. Right? So effectively you write a for loop 
over the older iteration domains, and then you are just it, you are just assigning um, the result of computation to a CI. So if you want to do that on a GPU, what you want to do instead, instead you want to launch as many threads that are equals to the amount of uh, the, uh, the, that's bigger than the amount of element actually than the in the array. Okay. And then we're going to do this kind of computation. So in here, the thread index gives you the relative position of a thread within a thread block, while the block index gives you a relative position of that particular thread block within a launching grid. And the block index corresponds to the number of threads within a thread block. So this computation effectively gives you the global of that of the of the thread that uh, this particular launching thread is in. And in here, the code tries to do, you know, it effectively computes a global thread index. And then for each thread, it's only doing one computation, right? So it's, if the thread ID is smaller than the number of element, we're just going to perform that one computation, load from A, load from B, do the addition, and then write the result back on the C. And each of thread is only going to do that one element computation in parallel. So we can also come back to this visualization that hopefully gives you a better sense of what's going on in here. So let's assume that we're going to launch um, each of thread block contains four threads. In this case, uh, let's, let's assume that we're going to launch two thread blocks. So in total, there are eight threads in here. And uh, so the block dimension equals, uh, equals four because you know, each of the thread block contains four elements. And effectively, you can find that the global offset that we're having here, depending on the thread index and block index, each of thread is in, you will get you will compute a global index that corresponds to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Right? So you will get uh, the global index that corresponds to each of the element in here. And uh, and of course we need to be careful so that the number of total threads covers is bigger than the number of elements in here, right? Let's assume it is the case in this particular example. So in here we can find that each of the threads effectively computes their own individual global offset. And that's the only difference between uh, the code that being executed on the same or, or different threads. So that's why you can find it's called single instruction. Effectively, all the threads are launching the same piece of code, except that their environment thread index and the block index are going to be different. So as a result, they are executing different code passes in here. And for each of the threads, it's going to load the data from A and B and store on the C. So you can find that it's kind of an interesting pattern in here, right? So in order to be able to parallelize the original sequential C CPU code, what we do is that we are trying to distribute the work of each of the element computation onto different threads. So each of the thread is doing different tasks. And, uh, and you know, after all the threads finish that work, we get the result of vector add in an efficient, efficient way, right? On the other hand, I also want us to pause a second because right now what we did is we kind of manually translate a CPU code, right? That was that was a sequential code onto a parallel CUDA code that allows us to be able to run on GPU. This natural question to ask, you know, is it possible to translate arbitrary CPU code onto onto the CUDA version? If we pause a bit. Think about this question. Of course, it, it doesn't seem to be so, right? There seems to be something. There's no free launching here. So what happened? What makes this program particularly easy to be able to translate onto a GPU program? The reason is that you find that when you look at this computation, for each of our eyes, the computation is not dependent on each other, right? So so as a result, we will be able to, this is called a data parallel program, that allows us to perform each of element computation in an independently. If we have a different kind of program, such kind of parallelization might be harder. For example, if I'm going to write CI equals C maximum of I minus one zero plus AI. In this case, you can find that the result of, and I'm going to do four over i's, 
Okay. In this case, you can find that the result of CI is going to be dependent on the result of the previous element. Of course, there are also a parallel algorithm that does this, uh, called you know a parallel scan. But it's still not trivial to directly do it using you know the data parallel computation path. So really, in a lot of cases, the ability to parallelize depends on how much independence we have across each element of computation. Of course, uh, in this case, you know, so far we have only shown the GPU side code, which is on the top. In order to really go ahead and run this program uh, on, on my machine, you also need what we call a host side of a code or a CPU side of a code that, uh, that allows us to be able to launch the kernel. So specifically, in this code, what I try to do is we start with three data, three arrays that come from CPU. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to call CUDA allocate. It's going to allocate my data on the GPU DRAM. So if you think about a typical uh, host and a, and a GPU setting, you will have uh, this uh, GPU, this is a host, and there's a PCI E bus that connects to between them, right? So when we're trying to call CUDA alloc, what you are effectively doing is you're allocating memories that points to an origin on a GPU. So if you simply call CUDA malloc, actually this pointer do not correspond to any uh, regions on a CPU, unless you know you use some kind of unified memory feature of CUDA program. So when you call CUDA memory copy, these operations help us to be able to take uh, original memory and copy the data onto the corresponding regions on GPU. So effectively, the original data sits on the host, and we are going to copy it onto the GPU memory. And then what we are doing here is we are going to calculate how many thread blocks we need in order to cover the total number of elements in here, in this number of elements. And what we're going to see is we're going to launch 512 threads per block and imagine that n equals you know 120 uh, 124 then we need two blocks to cover this okay? and then um, we're going to launch a CUDA kernel with you know so many threads on per block and number of blocks by passing in the GPU pointer this code still runs on the host and then the corresponding GPU code is going to start launching on the GPU side. Finally, we're going to copy the data from the GPU memory back on the CPU, and then we will be able to go and verify the you know, correctness of the C CPU in this case to see if it really corresponds to the result of addition. So this code kind of demonstrates the entire workflow of GPU computing, right? Because usually the data starts on CPU. You want to allocate memory on the GPU, you copy the data from a CPU on the GPU, perform some computation, then copy the back. On the other hand, this is not really what happened in most of the different computation, but actually this was the code that I initially write when I started to learn GPU programming. So to give an anecdote, so when I started working on um, accelerating deep learning, the first cool acceleration code I wrote is like this, like I'm trying to write a accelerate the convolution kernel. So what we did is let's take the data from the CPU arrays, copy it to the GPU, run the CUDA-based acceleration, and copy it back. But then I find out, hmm, seems that at most it can only get about 1.3x speed up versus the FFDX, FFDW-based CPU implementation I had. What happened? Seems that they all told me that GPU it's very powerful. I shouldn't have only got you know 1.3x speed up. So then, if you dig deeper, you'll find that actually the bottleneck of computation is wasted on the memory copies in here because we're kind of copying the data back and forth from CPU and GPU, and PCIe bus is coming the bottleneck. So in real world examples, most of a CUDA code execution is not going to look like this. Instead, we're going to try to allocate the memory on CUDA, on GPU, I want to keep the data on GPU as much as possible. So if I'm, if I'm going to run one layer of convolution, I'm going to take that input data on GPU, run a convolution result, write down on GPU memory, 
And the second time when I'm going to run follow-up computations at ReLU and other cases, I'm going to directly load the data from that GPU memory right, and run computation. It seems to, to be so obvious today, but that was kind of a mistake that I made when we started to work on GPU computation. So real-world applications really try to keep data in GPU memory as long as possible. That's that, that's why you know when you start to look at uh, when, when you start to write code like PyTorch or Needle even right when you start to write computations you wouldn't call dot numpy as often because dot numpy will bring that data back from the CPU and convert that onto a numpy array. Instead, you would directly run computations on the GPU arrays uh, array pointers, and so you know one computation follow another. They all simply perform GPU kernels that loads from GPU array and writes onto the corresponding GPU array. Okay, so this is a example programming model, FUDA. Um, you know, however, you know, as I as I told everybody, there are other GPU programming models. For example, here are two examples uh, of other GPU programming models. On top is the OpenCL programming model that's being used, for example, on ARM GPUs. And the bottom is a, a program model called Metal that is being used on Apple devices. In both cases, you can find that they are this is a very similar correspondent. For example, you know, uh, except the slightly different keyword, you'll get both A, B, and C. Uh, they are like, for example, in Metal, they are buffer annotations. In OpenCL, it's called global. Uh, in OpenCL, there's a global ID that indicates the global thread index. Similarly, you know, there is a global ID in the metal program model. And in a lot of cases you can find, you will be able to find an almost one-to-one -one translation correspondence by taking one GPU programming model and tra manually translate to another one. They're not really that different. So that's why you know, a lot of the concepts you learn in one case is gonna be applicable in other cases as well. Okay. So now we have to take a look at the first taste of GPU programming. Let's start to try to dive, dive slightly deeper onto some of the details in here. And in this particular case, let's come back to what we call GPU memory health. So um, we know that GPU contains a two level of threading hierarchies, right? You have threads and those threads form thread blocks that gives you a launching grade that you launch together. On the other hand, up until now, we have not made use of that, of that fact, right? All we, all we did so far is I'm going to find a global index of the GPU thread ID. I'm going to use that global index to run computations of different elements of it. So, um, but let's come back to this and let's start to, uh, you know, try to think about additional elements that we will need to use of this multiple level of hierarchies. So specifically, the reason why we need this two level threading structure is because GPU in nature kind of contains this two level threading structure. So within a GPU, each of the block can be mapped onto what we call stream multiple processors that uh, contains uh, multiple, multiple computing cores. So effectively, each of a thread block can get mapped onto one three multiprocessors. And in a lot of cases, you can even map you know, several, several thread blocks onto a same three multiprocessor. And then each of a thread will get mapped onto what we call a single computing core within that three multiprocessors. So you can find that that's kind of why we kind of have this two level hierarchy, because if we'll come back and look at the GPU themselves, a lot of GPU architecture themselves contain this two-level two hierarchy. The global memory here corresponds to the GPU memory, so that's the memory you get when you call CUDA malloc and CUDA free, and then you free called call CUDA free. Within a stream multiprocessor, though, there's a shared memory that's being shared across all the threads. So this is the memory that's accessible by all the threads within that thread blocks. And this is what we're going to focus on next. And of course, each of the threads have their own local registers as well. So let's take a look at another example. A slightly more complicated ones. Um, let's assume they want to do uh, perform a summation 
of a window of size five in here. So in fact, we are going to do sliding window. We are sliding the window from left to right. And each of the time, we are going to sum, uh, for example, in here, I'm going to sum the five elements together. So you can view this window sum as a simplified version of, for example, convolution. Right? So because it's like a one dimensional convolution with a filter of all ones in here. So, so the uh, most straightforward implementation we can have is, of course, you know, let's try to distribute all the output elements onto different threads. So, you know, I'm going to launch a GPU kernel that covers each of the element, and then for each of the element, I'm going to perform the sum in here. However, once once in your mind, notice that this is not the most efficient way of implementing this window. Specifically. Let's think about how many loads we need to load the inputs. For example, for each of element in here, I need to be able to load five input elements, right? So in total, I need to do five times unloading to perform this, this you know, vanilla window sum. So what we can do instead is that let's start to consider a thread block of four threads. In this case, if you look at this red block of four threads, in total, they only have to load, let's say, eight elements, right? So you, so, so you can find that there are a lot of overlaps in their loading. From this thread is going to load this piece of element, and this thread is going to load this piece of element. You can find there are a lot of loading overlap between those threads, and that's where a shared memory is going to be become helpful. So, so the the idea here is that first of all, we're going to allocate a temporal shared memory that comes from these uh, that 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 allows us to fetch these temporal inputs in here in a green area. And then we will have all the threads we try to cooperatively fetch the data onto onto the shared memory. So in this case, for example, we could have the first four threads fetch the first four elements, and then have them also fetch the other four elements. So in total, each of us thread only have to fetch two elements as opposed to five elements. So that in terms of the number of data loads we save, we are kind of we, we save two over five. Um, oh, there's a two over five memory load saving in here. How do we load the data onto shared memory? What we're going to do is we call synchronize threads. So this is a function that allows all the threads to wait, pause a bit, so that we'll allow all the threads to finish. And after sync threads finishes, we know that the temporal memory in here already stores the uh, data being loaded by all the threads. So that we can then go ahead and perform the for loop summations that sums over all the result elements. So in this code example, you can find that one of the key advantages we are trying to get in here is we are trying to leverage a shared memory and the are memory loading reuse between the threads. So we are using the shared memory to store the temporal result and then loading from that shared memory to allow us to run further computations. And this is a very common technique that being used in GPU acceleration. So in the first part, we have, we have two high level takeaways. So the first high level takeaway is that the GPU program model sits in this two level thread hierarchy. We have launching thread grids and blocks. And then uh, in order for us to be able to make use of shared memory, you want to be able to cooperatively fetch common areas, common data to the shared memory to help us to increase the memory reuse across different threads. Now we have finished discussing the general GPU programming technique, let's come back and do a case study on matrix modifications on GPU. So again, let's start to look at a transpose matrix modification. Uh, in this case, uh, you know, let's look at the code of CIJ equals sum K 
AKI times BKJ. So we are kind of transporting A in this case. Okay. And there are techniques that we learned from the last lecture that's still going to be useful in here. That will call register tally. So, so what we're trying to do is first of all, we're going to allocate a submatrix V by V, where V is kind of a tiling factor we have in here. And then we're going to also allocate um, two temporal inputs, AV and BV. By the way, the CAB will go into, they will be mapped on to the GPU registers. And that is kind of the most efficient storage you can get on GPUs. Then what we're going to do is for each of iterations, we are going to load a stripe of this uh, input data from both A and B. Right? And then we're going to do this inner dot product, outer product operations by just looping over, you know, uh, X and Y and doing CYX plus equal AY times BX. And this code, this piece of code actually will get unrolled so that they become the effectively the register multiply add code. And after we perform these operations, we're going to store the data back onto the Chris Morning memory regions that we're interested in. So this is called register level tally. And if you remember from the last lecture, we know that you know, by tallying A and B by a factor of V, right? So each of a term, each element of A is going to be reused by V terms. So the total number of memory loads is going to be n cubed divided by v for each of the threads. So as a result, you get more memory reuse, and it gives you the ability to be able to speed up your computation so that memory don't become a bottleneck. If you are interested, I would certainly recommend you to go ahead and try to you know, write a CUDA program like this and get a feeling of you know what kind of like uh, accelerations you can get by just turning over the uh, register factors. Of course, you know, because the GPU memory contains this kind of two level memory hierarchy. So not only we can get reused through the same threads by, by using register tilings, we can also try to get reused across the thread within the thread block. That's where the shared memory kicks in. So the second level of tiling that we can perform here is what we call shared memory tiling. So in this case, let's assume that we are going to do a L by L uh, submatrix. Each of thread block is going to do an L by L submatrix computation. And of course, you know, each of the threads still performs V by V computation. So we are going to launch L by L divided by V times L over V threads per thread block. In this case, we are going to leverage what we call multi-dimensional thread launch. So you know, there will be like a block index is two dimensional and thread index is also two dimensional. Um, we can easily translate the one dimensional thread block onto multi-dimensional by just doing like modular divisions of the corresponding thread index and so on. Um, but you know, let's come back and take a look at this, right? Let's assume that each of the thread blocks compute this bigger region and each of the threads compute this smaller region. If you look at the code, the data that's need to be computed, the region that may be computed by the first thread, you'll find that it's going to need this region of A and this region of B. If I want to go ahead and compute the data needed by this thread block, this thread, which is another thread, it's going to need the same piece of memory by A. Where you can find that, hey, these threads have reused across each other. So that's why it's helpful to be able to load in this S by L memory regions onto the shared memory so that we'll be able to you know, leverage those S by L regions and then loading data from those shared memory onto the local GPU uh, computing cost to run for the computation. So in here, what we do is we will try to first allocate shared memory of S by L, where the S is kind of a striking, the, the, the tiling factor we had on reduction dimension. Sometimes it's useful because I look at you know, loop on rollings and, uh, and the sometimes transposition. So what you do is that, you know, 
we are going to first iterate over the reduction dimension. In each of the case, we want to be able to fetch the corresponding data first onto the shared memory. And we know that they are reused across those threads, right? So let's first have those threads working together to fetch the data on the shared memory. And then after we get the data onto the shared memory, what we next, I'm going to do the inner iterations, loading the data from a shared memory, and do the register tile matrix multiplication here. And finally, after we finish the computation, we're going to load the, we're going to write the data back and on the global memory as usual. So if you look at this particular piece of code, you can find that there are kind of two kind of memory reuse you're getting here, right? The first memory reuse is this shared memory perfection. And because, you know, uh, we are doing global to shared memory copy in this case, we're, we're getting L amount of reuse depending on the L telling factor. And then there's also a shared memory to register reuse because you get, you know, a register telling factor of V, you simply get a V, uh, you know, re reuses across those elements. So by choosing the L and V carefully, we will be able to get, uh, we will be get, able to get a quite efficient GPU implementation. Of course, it's not going to be the most efficient one, but you will be able to get, I think, at least 20% or 40% utilizations of the GPU cost uh, through this kind of a two level of, of registry. Of course, one of the key questions that one might ask is how can we go ahead and choose the values of L and V? Right? So on the CPU, it's already kind of complicated. You know, you, you need to go ahead and think about hmm, on a CPU, I will need to be able to make sure that I pick the bigger amount of V so that I will have, you know, um, I will make use of all the registers, but they're not exceeding the total amount of register I have. Right. On GPU, it's even more complicated because there's a trade-off among the number of registers you have in each of the threads, the number of threads you are able to launch because the total amount of registers on each of the stream processors, stream microprocessors is a constant factor. That means that we can no longer, if we want to launch a thread with more registers, we're going to only be able to launch fewer threads. And if you're going to launch fewer threads in total, one of the problems is that we get less parallel. So when we, when we start to look at code like this, when I'm doing memory fetching, actually shared memory fetching is slow. So one of the things that GPU helps you to do is if I'm waiting for the memory loads in here and there are other idle threads that can come and run computations, what is going to happen is it's going to context switch to other threads that uh, runs follow-up computation. So, <coughs> excuse me. So in this case, you know, in a lot of cases, they will be able to have the data loading and computation run concurrently if you have sufficient amount of threads because some of the threads are going to load the data, so they're going to wait for the data. And you context switch to other threads that they run the computation. But that really depends on you have sufficient large amount of threads in here. So that's one trade-off between, you know, having more threads versus you know, having less threads, but each of the threads making use of more, uh, more registers. There's also a similar kind of trade-off in terms of the size of shared memory you can pick. Of course, on one hand, we want to bigger, be able to pick a bigger amount of shared memory, right? But on the other hand, if you have a bigger amount of shared memory, there are fewer thread blocks you can fit onto the same stream multi processors. And as a result, you know, for example, if one of the thread block, in this case, stored, you don't have other thread blocks to context switching to. So again, that's a very delicate trade-off here. So when we are trying to go and pick, for example, the values of S, L, and V, you know, it is something that uh, affects, that is being affected by a lot of factors. Uh, one of the ways that people do is people can use what technical auto-tuning. So the idea is you go, you come out and you try out different values of S, L, S, L and V, and, and see you know what are the what are the results and uh, we're going to go ahead and pick a reasonable one based on you know the auto tuning results so that's kind of one typical approach that people come and do it uh, of course you know if you want to do more careful analysis maybe you will you will be able to come with analytical solutions for some of the large cases as well 
But in general, it's good to keep in mind that you know there are a lot of the factors that come into play when look at the when looking at the GPU code executions. But on the other hand, memory reuse is again a very important factor in here. In this case, there are both memory reuse within the same thread and memory reuse across different threads on a single GPU block. So so far. We have just write you know this as a equals uh, a computation right in a in a in a succinct pseudo code. Effectively, in order to do that, we still need to be able to cooperatively fetch all the data of the corresponding regions. Uh, so so effectively, this code is going to be expanded onto the code below. That's going to iterate over um, iterate. Over, over the elements, and we're going to divide the entire workload onto the work done by each of the thread in here. So each of the, each of the fetching here is going to correspond to a corporate fetching among multiple threads, where each of the thread is going to perform you know, one part of the job. One of the things I want to notice here is that in the corporate fetching, the job that the fetching job that thread A did may try to fetch the data that's also needed by another thread. So that's why it's called cooperative fetching, because each of the thread is going to do their own local jobs, and they collectively fulfill the task of fetching the data onto the corresponding GPU shared memory region. OK? So far, we have covered two use cases, right? We covered you know, the uh, traditional, the, the simple basic GPU programming models and how we can come and program a GPU. We also cover you know, how uh, we can use those techniques such as shared memory reloading and the GPU parallelisms to accelerate matrix applications. There are a lot more GPU programming techniques that you can use to accelerate a GPU code. For example, one of the important things we want to make sure is we want to be able to make sure that all the threads uh, within a thread block try to load data from a continuous region as opposed to from a discontinuous region. And usually that leads to that's going to lead to a better you know, memory utilization here. There's also this concept called shared memory bank conflict, where you want to make sure that each of the threads writes to different shared memory, shared memory banks uh, so that uh, you know and uh, so so that you know all the shared each of a shared memory address actually can be grouped onto different regions, banking regions, and we want to make sure that each of a thread writes to different regions. Um, we are also this technical software pipeline that allows us to do the data loading and computations uh, in a concurrent fashion. And there are also techniques called warp level optimizations that allows you to perform certain computations at what we call a warp level, where it's even a smaller generality of the of the thread block where you know each of what can perform some of the collective computations in here. Finally, a lot of the modern hardware come with this modern acceleration unit called Tensor Core that allows us to be able to take data from uh, from a, you know from a specific uh, warp and allows us to do uh, matrix matrix computations using specialized accelerations. All those techniques are important techniques to really get us the maximum benefit of a GPU accelerator. And they are, if you are interested in understanding all those techniques, you are more than welcome to check out from a CUDA programming guide. And there are a lot of materials on GPU programming online that can help you to get started. So of course, this lecture is going to be serve as an introduction material that helps you to get started. And there are a lot, a lot more that we can learn together. So that is the end of today's lecture. Thanks everybody for coming. And in the next lecture, we're going to dive deeper into some of the implementation details of Hardware Acceleration Library. I will see you in the next lecture.